The investment is made possible by KCF Technologies in State College, founded on a vision to transform American industry. The official industrial innovation partner of Penn State Athletics. Online at kcftech.com. Everett Cash Mutual Insurance Company, providing farm and commercial insurance coverage for Pennsylvania's farming and agribusiness industries since 1913. Information at www.everettcash.com. Ben Franklin Technology Partners, Ulysne Financial Communications and Strategy, and viewers like you. Thank you. Investment breeds innovation, and an innovative idea can change the world. Penn State, along with the PennTap U.S. EDA University Center, is committed to engaging with young entrepreneurs, and through Inc. U, will award a total of $30,000 to winning student-owned companies. Teams from Penn State will compete to impress a panel of judges with their unique ideas. Each team will have a chance to pitch the panel and see if they can stand up to the judges' scrutiny. The team or teams with the strongest ideas and best pitches will leave with the seed money necessary to jumpstart their companies. The competition will be intense and the money will be given to only the most innovative ideas. Judges are waiting. The teams are ready. This is the investment. Our judges come from all corners of the business and entrepreneurial world. Bob Morgan is founder and CEO of Teleria Media. Lou Childs is co-founder and COO of Dovetail Essentials. Sherry Collins is executive director of corporate relations for the Pennsylvania Department of Community and Economic Development. Jordan Redner is executive director and COO of Decoded Advertising. Those are our judges. Now it's time for our teams to impress them. Our first team is Girls Code the World. My name is Sydney Gibbard. I am a sophomore majoring in biomedical engineering and I'm also on a pre-med track, so I hope to go to medical school one day. Growing up, both my co-founder Mina and I had access to a wealth of resources and opportunities that got us excited about science, technology, engineering, and math, otherwise known as STEM, and being a girl in this field. But when we got to high school, we became more aware of the fact that most girls do not have access to those opportunities. So as juniors in high school, Mina and I founded our own organization, Girls Code the World, with the goal of gathering the opportunities we had access to and sharing them with other girls. So Girls Code the World looks to specifically serve low-income and minority communities. So in order to keep any potential costs for our participants of our program free, we raise almost all of our funds through grants and donations from corporations and donors who support our mission. This money would fund a year's worth of programs for over 100 girls. It would pay high school students to run these programs in their own communities and have access to leadership opportunities. We really would like to connect with a curriculum specialist to go over our curriculum with us and actually certify it. We also would like to update our website with the help of a female IT specialist so that it hosts videos of home activities. And also we would like to bring in education specialists to help us develop a standardized training program for our employees. Hi, my name is Sydney Gibbard and I'm one of the founders of Girls Code the World. Not all girls, in fact most girls, do not have the financial means to have influential STEM experiences growing up, or their community does not provide them with the resources they need to be confident as a girl in STEM. And this is reflected in the staggering fact that less than 16% of engineers and architects are women, and less than 25% of computer and mathematical positions are occupied by a woman. My co-founder Mina and I recognized these inequities once we got to high school and began interacting with communities other than our own. Having more diverse representation in STEM allows for more innovative products and promotes a more collaborative company culture. As juniors in high school, we founded Girls Code the World with providing the opportunities we had access to and sharing them with other girls. 
Girls Code the World looks to specifically serve low-income and minority communities. In order to keep any potential costs for our program free, we raise our funds through grants and donations. We've also been through the Summer Founders Program at Happy Valley Launchbox, which really helped us identify the market we work in and how to be a sustainable business. We are asking for $30,000 for our organization. All funds we receive will have a direct impact on the opportunities and services we provide for girls. With funding as large as this, we plan to use it to grow our programming and develop the framework for expansion. First, the greatest need for funding is programming sessions. Program funds pay for every participant's activity box, and it also pays high school and college girls through a set amount stipend. This stipend is extremely important to our values as an organization. It is a reminder to girls who run our programs that their work has value and it's contributing to the community. Once they lead a program themselves, they train younger girls on how to run programs. This instills confidence in them that these girls are good at STEM, and it encourages them to go into STEM-related fields in university. Other funding would be used for institutional costs such as developing a website with the help of a female IT specialist or student. We will host courses on our website so that girls can enroll in them and do them asynchronously, which eliminates barriers to participating in our program. Finally, this funding would be used to create a Girls Code the World endowment that will be used to provide scholarships for alumni of our program. These scholarships will pay for girls to attend STEM programs and conferences once they get to high school, and it will also go towards alumni who pursue STEM-related fields in university. This ensures engagement from our programming participants far beyond their initial programming experience. Please join us in empowering young girls through STEM. Let girls be in control of their destiny and code their own future by supporting Girls Code the World. Thank you. Kudos to what, what you uh, and Mina are doing. I think it's uh, not just worthy, but I think it's really needed. So kudos. My first uh, question is going to be an interesting one for you because I'm a contributor to Girls Who Code. I'm curious to understand uh, if you see that, uh, if you're aware of Girls Who Code, which is a pretty active organization, uh, and it's how it's affecting your approach. It does concern me that there is some, that it can cause some confusion in the market. So why don't we, why don't we start with that? Because that's sort of the, to me, that's the overarching issue with, uh, with your endeavor. Um, we are familiar with Girls Who Code. Um, I know that that's a very well-known organization in the United States. Um, the reason why we're unique from Girls Who Code is, first of all, we don't just focus on coding. We also incorporate engineering projects, also biology and chemistry focuses as well. Um, also, we're very locally based, um, and we use that to an advantage by, we work with schools and their teachers to match our curriculum to what their needs are as a school. And we connect with them and make sure that we are either reflecting what happens in their curriculum or preparing the girls for middle school in the best way possible. Um, it's not just a standard curriculum that we deliver to every single girl that comes through our programming. We make sure that it fits what the school's needs are and also it, it um, is kid tailored to um, the population that we work with, which um, in some schools it might be primarily socioeconomically disadvantaged girls, so we bring in speakers that reflect that population as well. To your point, though, I wanted to add, you might want to look into getting it trademarked and see if a trademark attorney sees that your the name of your company is at conflict with theirs. Because um, you don't want to get real far down the road and find that out and then you have to rebrand everything. It was mentioned in your pitch that you have employees in a stipend program for high school and college women. And I wondered if you could tell us more about the salaries and the percentage of the funds that you have raised so far going towards those employee costs. Each of the girls who runs a program receives $500 for running that week long of programs, which is a lot of money for those high school girls who spend about 30 to 40 hours um, during that week really running programs and leading up to it. They also work with us to um, make sure that they are prepared for the program and they also develop their educational teacher skills. Right now, probably about 75 to 80% of our costs go towards um, employee costs and also buying those materials like the maker box course, um, the maker boxes for the girls who participate in our programming. Very good, thank you. Thank you for your presentation and, and building Girls Code the World and best of luck with everything in the future. Thank you so much. Our second team is Miss Monroe Collection. 
My name is Jayla Manuel, and I'm a sophomore majoring in political science, as well as pursuing the Snow Business Certificate at University Parks Campus at Penn State. It was like the beginning-ish of the pandemic. Looking at everybody and everything, and I realized how easy it was to have so much taken from you. So I decided to start a business all my life. I've never really been a person who liked to put chemicals in my hair. My hair used to grow crazily when I was younger. The Miss Monroe Collection is an organic hair care company. I started actually making different types of products and then testing them on my mom. You know, she was like, I really love this. My hair is growing. Oh my gosh, my hair is getting thicker. Our primary focus is really to cater to people of color. There are a lot of hair care brands out there and a lot of them don't have campaigns targeted to who we as people of color really are. Just being able to connect with a business that shares the same values as you is really important. Success for me is staying true to my original mission to empower people of color to feel beautiful, you know, through their natural hair. I wanted to sell the truth. So making sure that I actually have empowered people that they feel confident being their natural selves. My name is Jalen Monroe and I am the owner of the Miss Monroe Collection and the beauty industry has failed me. All of my life I struggled with embracing my natural hair. As a child I was often called names that killed my self-esteem. It was phrases like nappy headed that steered me into wearing weaves ever since the age of three. Unfortunately this is not just my story but it's a reality that millions of women of color are going through every day. The beauty industry creates hair products and campaigns that aren't for people that look like me. Many mainstream hair care companies have products that contain chemicals that are linked to cancer and DNA damage. That's why I started the Miss Monroe Collection. We are an organic hair care company. We offer handmade products from organic ingredients like shampoo, conditioner, hair growth oils, and moisturizers. Our products combat dry brittle hair, split ends, itchy scalp, and we also offer long-term benefits such as strength and length. We also offer campaigns that are targeted at natural beauty rather than societal standards. Currently, our target audience is people of color, but we're really trying to focus on black students at primarily white institutions because they're more likely to purchase their products online. Blacks spend about $473 million total in hair care, and black spending power often creates a halo effect which allows small businesses like me to grow mainstream outside of the people of color community. In the past seven months, we were able to test and develop multiple products, create great branding and packaging, ship orders to 17 different states, and we've started generating revenue. We recently implemented a student ambassador program for black students at primarily white institutions, and we currently have ambassadors at four different universities so far. We're estimating our revenue to reach at least $22,000 next year as we increase our representation in different universities. We currently sell our products through our website, but we're working on getting our products in hair stores in Philadelphia and then we're going to be working on getting our products in local beauty supply stores in different states. As the beauty industry has spelled me, I know what my audience wants and I know what they will buy. With that, we are asking for $30,000. We're looking to use the funding to go towards traveling, to really network with different beauty supply shops in different cities, to do pop-up shops, and to really push our brand into different areas, as well as marketing and content production. And we're not looking to market only on social media, but more traditional platforms like bus billboard and TV marketing with this funding we feel like we'll really be able to reach our audience and to bring to life some of the newer ideas for the Miss Monroe collection it's time to grow with Miss Monroe will you go with me at this time I'd like to thank you and open up to any questions that you may have Hi, Jalen. It's so nice to meet you. Thanks again for your presentation. One of the questions that I have for you is, you know, the beauty industry, as you know, and you identified in your presentation, is huge. It's astronomical. How are you going to differentiate yourself within such a large space? And can you explain to us a little bit about what Miss Monroe is going to do as far as breaking into that competitive marketplace? Well, many people are understanding the need for ethic care care, and it's definitely becoming a more common thing. But what most brands are doing are they're just manufacturing another product that they don't truly know the impact of and just putting a black girl on a commercial or an ad to show diversity. Whereas I am actually my own audience and I understand what it means to be my audience. So instead of trying to attack the whole entire 
hair care market at once, I'm focusing primarily on um, my niche market, which is people of color at primarily white institutions. Those are the people that don't have beauty supply shops around them. Those are the people that are looking online specifically for products because they can't get products where they're at exactly. So my strategy is really to hit that market because in hair care, you know, once people start using your product and they like it, they're more likely to come back and to come get it. So that's one thing that I'm trying as well as I'm also trying to connect with different beauty supply shops and contacting them, sending them samples of my products to see if they like it, can they put it in their stores. So based on what I saw on your website and in your materials, your products appear to be all natural. Can you talk a little bit about the shelf life of those? So if there's if there's not a lot of preservatives in it, how do you actually keep the shelf life uh, and the product stable? So we always tell our um, customers that our shelf life is for up to six months. That's why we tell the customers they use the product daily. If they use it daily, they'll need a new product within the next month. Um, it's only a one ounce bottle, so they'll go through it pretty fast, so they won't even have to keep it for that full six months. I was interested in how many products you have and are you do you know the margins for those products? So I believe we have about seven products total that we put out and our profit margins for them, we normally spend about the unit price for each of them is no more than two dollars and I always sell my products for about ten dollars. So we have like about a uh, eighty 86 profit margin because some of the products are between like one, 130 to $2 to make. Okay, well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure meeting you. Best of luck with Ms. Monroe and we'll look forward to seeing your products out in the marketplace. Thank you. Our third team is Table Rock Markets. Hello, I'm Jake Grimm. I'm a business management and marketing manager at Penn State Mount Alto. Hello, my name is Aiden Rauscher and I'm a computer science major at Penn State. I grew up on a small farm outside of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. I started college studying engineering, but after two years, I realized that was not my future and I missed my roots in the agricultural industry. And so I switched to business management and marketing with the focus to use my experience with technology to innovate the agricultural industry. So if you're a farmer, you can go to taberockmarkets.com. You can create an account, activate our credit card processor, and then within about one to three days, you'll be approved and you can start selling online. From that point, you can take a picture and upload your products, track your inventory, and from then on, your consumers through Tape Rock Markets can buy products from you you receive the invoice and then you prepare those orders to be sent to them via through the market. What I fit in as a computer science major is that we're trying to facilitate online sales uh, for farmers markets. So obviously there's a need for a lot of coding and building the website. In order for us to be successful, I think that looks like us having lots of farms connected between different communities. That way we can kind of get the full use out of our platform and allow people to search, discover new markets, and also continue to shop with their favorite ones. I believe in the future of agriculture, and I know that we're heading in a brighter direction. Every day, three times a day, you and I need a farmer. Yet these farmers who work so hard are struggling. Hi, I'm Jake Grimm. And I'm Aiden Rauscher. We're here today to tell you about Table Rock Markets. It is our mission to resolve two major issues that farmers are facing today, profitability and adjusting to the digital age. Table Rock Markets bridges the gap between farmer and digital business. We are a web-based platform designed for farmers to sell fresh, locally grown products. The core function of Table Rock Markets is connecting consumers with local farmers and engaging online purchases. Unlike other digital marketplaces, Table Rock Markets allows consumers to discover new vendors, browse product, and make purchases all under one platform. We remove the need for farmers to build and maintain their own websites, allowing them to spend more time doing the work they love. Farmers can sign up, upload products, and have their own online store in less time than it'll take you to eat dinner tonight. To reach critical mass and geographical density, we're initially targeting vendors and shoppers at farmers markets. There is no sign-on fee to use Table Rock Markets. We simply charge 4.9% plus 30 cents per transaction. 
We're very excited about the progress we've made. The local farm we've been working with has seen a 25% increase in revenue in the past year due to online sales on their website. That's roughly $1 million of fruits and vegetables sold online. To take advantage of the convenience and reliability we offer, they have transferred their online business to TableRockMarkets.com, which saves them about 10 labor hours per week. The Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture is also offering their support by connecting us with farmers all across the state. Table Rock Markets is ready to scale. In the next six months, we expect to finish initial software development and release a mobile application while bringing 100 farms onto our platform. Within a year, we plan to have 300 farms selling on our platform, continuing this growth into the future. Not only is our business growing, but our team is too. We currently have seven talented members using their unique skills to make Table Rock Markets a success. With $30,000, we will improve our user interface, develop a mobile application, and implement our farmer onboarding plan. We will also hire three interns to help us achieve our goal this summer. Thank you for your time, and we're looking forward to answering your questions. Hello, Aiden and Jake. It's a pleasure to meet you and uh, excited to learn a little bit more about Table Rock Markets. There's a lot of things that contribute to farmers not adopting technology. How much time have you spent surveying and talking to the farmers about potential risk or things that would inhibit them from adopting your product to include things like lack of cell phone coverage or Wi-Fi or things like that? So I too grew up on a farm, uh, an equestrian farm. So I understand the, the struggles that farmers go through and constantly in contact and working with them, um, which is really important in our development and understanding the issues that our farmers are having and our consumers. Um, Aiden, would you like to touch upon something that we've implemented just in the last week or two uh, to help make it easier for our farmers? Yep, so one of the areas where farmers might feel less confident is typing and doing inventory, which for farms with a lot of products um, can be time consuming. So one of the things we implemented is speech to text. So that way farmers can just talk into their computers and it puts their inventory up for them and helps them assist in that process. Um, and also we're trying to develop a mobile application that's part of our process moving forward. And that way, uh, whether they have computers or mobile phones, um, our site is accessible to all farmers. I enjoy and appreciate the role that our farmers play, but as somebody that actually wants to consume product from the local farmer or those in the community, how do I find out about where they are? So if I'm not following a local farmer's market on a regular basis, then how do I know where I can actually get your products? And do you envision an opportunity where social media could be used to, to do those pushes? Yes and yes. Um, with Team Rock Markets, you can find farms in three different aspects. And one of those is geographically. And so by putting in the location from your farm, so I live in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. I put in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, it then tells me the farmers that are selling at the Adams County Farmers Market, which is very local. Um, social media is a key aspect that we're working with to promote Tape Rock Markets. And so something we're developing right now is that after you complete a purchase, uh, about a week later, you'll get a notification asking, how did you like those products? And if you like them, uh, with a click of button, then you can share it to your own social media page, which then exponentially increases our customer base. Yeah, and in addition to that, part of our um main market we're trying to break into is with farms and bring some of their current customers onto our platform, um, attracting them with our convenience. And then by doing that, we also get the advantage of word of mouth and their social media advertising, kind of pushing out our product to their friends. All right, Thank well you. done, Jake and Aiden. Thank you very much. And uh, best of luck to everything with Table Rock Markets and, you know, uh, great job in, in a space that really needs the, you know, the help to become more efficient and more viable. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our fourth team is Sports Data Now. Hi, my name is Andrew Brilliant. I'm an industrial engineering and entrepreneurship major. Uh, I'm a senior from University Park. I've always been a, a diehard Philly sports fan. I've researched stats and played fantasy sports for years. And recently I had an internship past summer at a company where I worked in data visualization, manipulating and making dashboards and, and presenting information and data in a way that is much more digestible for the consumer. I combined skills that I gained that summer in data visualization and my, my passion for, for statistics and sports in general. When you think about the sports data industry, there's probably billions of rows of data with player statistics, play-by-play -play information. As a user, a casual user who's literally just playing fantasy sports for fun, it's pretty overwhelming to be able to have a platform that digests that and then give you just the information and the data rows that you need. It is pretty important.
So Sports Data Now is essentially a data research platform that improves upon the current statistic platforms that are out there. Currently, you look up a quarterback like Aaron Rodgers, for example, you put that into Google, you'll get every stat you need. But the way that they pre present that information is pretty boring and overwhelming. So our goal is to really jazz that up and then give the power back to the user and let them manipulate, filter, move and sort columns uh, or even hide information that they don't want or need. There's 70 million active fantasy players, sports bettors and researchers out there. And our job is just to reach even just a small percentage of that. Growing up, my pop-up could recall any fact that you wanted to know about the Rowan baseball team he coached. He knew the stats of his catcher like the back of his hand. Some of my favorite memories with him were sitting on his lap looking up stats. So I found it odd that all these years later, the way we were presented with sports data then is hardly distinguishable from how it's presented today. My name is Andrew Brillia, founder of Sports Data Now, bringing you your sports data the way you want it. I started Sports Data Now because I was a frustrated customer. I played fantasy sports, researched stats, and developed data models for years. But I got fed up with our competitors who used outdated tables that showed you way more than you needed and required you to export your data to manipulate it to your needs. I had to visit multiple sites for different types of stats, fantasy information, and betting statistics. And even available premium plans seem basic for modern capabilities. Our solution is to finally bring sports data management into the 21st century, allowing the casual fancy player, sports better, hobbyists, and researcher alike to create their data their way by giving the most important data in one place and the power to alter that data through flexible widgets, advanced in-app filtering, saved queries, and the ability to build their own stats. With these features, we will provide the most personalized sports data experience on the internet. Our target market consists of 70 million active sports fantasy players, bettors, and researchers who we plan to reach creatively through popular sports blogs, podcasts, and fantasy embedding sites. We operate on a freemium business model, driving revenue in three ways, advertising, paid premium plans, and paid add-ons to foster a community of passionate and innovative sports junkies. In four short months, We've proven a concept and business model and developed a platform for large scale testing. And I have nothing but confidence in my team with a wide range of both technical and non-technical backgrounds. And we are blessed to be in the position today to ask for $30,000, 20,000 for the development and sustainment of our platform, 5,000 to feed that platform with complete data and 5,000 to market our brand to outpace competitors. Sports Data Now will launch August of 2021 with four major sports to fulfill our mission of giving sports fans not only a better platform than they grew up with, but a platform that even their grandkids deserve. Thank you. Looks like you're building a, an interesting product in a very uh, cool space. It's for those sports junkies. It's one that people are very passionate about. So go ahead and share a little bit about your thoughts on how you get those sports enthusiasts to to really jump on board and, and start using your platform? That's a good question. I think it's um, obviously a really interesting space and there's a lot of people, whether it might not be exactly what we're doing, um, we're trying to reinvent it in a different way and it's hard to, to market that in a lot of ways, but we have a lot of cool ideas and I think um, the, the current competitor kind of space out there, they really do not market at all. 95% um, of their, their site visits are, are all organic. Um, which is a challenge within itself for us, but I think that is also an opportunity for us to really market in a very modern um, and kind of capable way in the way that we think that sports data should be represented out there on the internet. On the data side, um, if you just look at sports data, like ESPN in the world, they publish so much data that to some degree, is, a lot of it is just meaningless when you're trying to make a decision. Have you thought about through your analytics, scaling that back? and figuring out what data is most important so that it's just from a user experience, you're, you're not bombarded with, with so much information, but you're getting the best information. Yeah, honestly, that, that problem right there is, is literally the crux of our platform, right? Scaling down exactly what all these companies are throwing at you, picking up the most important statistics, 
um, and allowing the users to bring in the ones that they see fit. And that is what we're trying to generate on our platform. We're trying to really innovate the way people look at sports stats and bring in kind of kind of new new thoughts and actions that really haven't been seen in this industry at all. Um, and I think opening up to the public and allowing them to do that is the best way to do it. When you talk about all the organic uh, activity, the reality is that organic activity is cheap, right? And uh, paid activity becomes very expensive. Uh, so let's talk some more about adoption and marketing because without some pretty strong affiliates, you will you will you'll you'll land yourselves in a sort of what I call analysis paralysis place, which is you'll have great data, but nobody will really care. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the marketing aspect and more specifically about uh, how you go about trying to uh, connect yourselves with the right platforms. It's a challenge. I'm going to be honest, like I don't have all the answers to, to the marketing question right now. And it, it's something I'm looking at and I have um, a lot of resources that I can reach out to in terms of the launch box here. But in terms of marketing, again, it's trying to to modernize the way we're doing it. And I know that sounds very vague, um, but bringing people into allowing them to share their passions, right? Giving them a platform that allows them to bring what they're doing um, and bring it to our platform. Well, Andrew, thank you very much. And thank you to Sports Data Now. Awesome, thank you guys. Our fifth team is Jerpa. My name is Austin Thomas. I'm a senior at University Park studying supply chain management at the Smeal School of Business, and I'm also enrolled in the Schreier Honors College. The main problem started from being at a big school like Penn State. I would go to football tailgates and notice some of my friends wearing thermals under their jeans, so kind of layering up to stay warm. So I wanted to create a sense of warmth and style, which would combine the two. So I thought of making jeans which were lined with Sherpa. So this past winter, we were able to really expand into hoodies because our supplier with the jeans fell through for the current COVID situation. With these hoodies, we were able to fully line them with Sherpa and also line the front pockets with Sherpa for your own personal hand warmers. So just continuing to innovate in this space is kind of how we plan to expand, but then also bringing back our jeans. We really think the sky's the limit for us. If we win the money, the main effort will be in scaling. This past season, we had two hoodie launches with over 200 hoodies each, which sold out in less than five minutes. If we're able to get the money, it will allow us to scale our business to not only increase quantities for our hoodies, but allow us to broaden our scale of products that we provide at once. Overall, this money means everything for our idea and business. Otherwise, I wouldn't be back on this show the year after I lost. Hello judges, my name is Austin Thomas and I'm the founder of Jerpa, a clothing brand looking to provide warmth, comfort, and style in all of the products we create. Throughout my life, I've always had a passion and goal to be an entrepreneur. It was my freshman year when I knew this could be made possible. I was at a football tailgate and noticed some of my friends wearing thermals and leggings under their jeans trying to stay warm. This led us to our initial product offering, which was jeans which were lined with Sherpa to provide a two-in-one product, which would keep you warm outside, but you also wouldn't be sweating inside. Customers loved this product. They started cuffing the bottoms to show off the Sherpa, and the slim straight fit was ideal for our target consumer, which is college students. Fast forward to this winter. We rebranded into just Sherpa rather than Sherpa jeans, and we've added to our product variety. This past winter, we were able to come out with hoodies, which are fully lined with Sherpa, along with lining the front pockets with Sherpa for your own personal hand warmers. Overall, we were able to sell over 700 units in our hoodies alone in just three months, including two hoodie launches which sold out of 200 units each in under just five minutes. These hoodies help bring our revenues from $20,000 to over $80,000. In this space, one of the ways which has allowed us to continue to grow is by making use and building relationships with athletes and celebrities. Over these past few months, some of the people who have been seen wearing Jerpa are the likes of Saquon Barkley from the New York Giants, Kendall Verdes from Dance Moms, and many more. Through our ability to continue to innovate and grow a name around our brand, along with stay involved with influencers such as athletes and celebrities, we believe this upcoming winter we can more than double our sales. So what differentiates us from our competition? Our business model and marketing plan are two big differentiators in that we operate in a launch format where we launch X amount of our product, sell out of it, and reinvest that into the next product which allows us to mitigate the risk of excess inventory. Our marketing plan is surrounded around our ambassador program, where we now have over 100 ambassadors from 23 schools around the country who spread the word via social media and word of mouth, which have generated almost all of our sales. 
The proof of concept has been proved. And now next winter, with our jeans, hoodies, and sweatpants coming back, along with licensing agreements with larger universities to brand on our products, the potential to be reached is huge. At Jerpa, we're asking for $30,000, $15,000 for marketing costs such as influencer marketing and social media marketing, $10,000 to help with acquiring licensing agreements with various universities, and $5,000 to help with inventory warehousing costs. Thank you for the opportunity, and I'd love to answer any questions you may have. Hi, Austin. Great to see you. I have a couple of marketing related questions for you. One is about the licensing agreements with colleges and universities. Can you give us more information about how that's working for you? Yeah, so that's something we're looking into, and that's through the CLC, which is the Collegiate Licensing Company. And through them, they have about 200 colleges, which is under them. So in terms of some of the costs that go into that, it's $250 for the first institution and then $125 for every institution thereafter. So, you know, we want to kind of integrate that with our ambassador program, having 100 ambassadors at over 23 schools. You know, imagine if some of these ambassadors, let's just say, for example, at Penn State, were able to also market products that were branded specifically towards Penn State. State. So being able to kind of interrelate the ambassador program along with the licensing company, we think it's a huge opportunity for us. And that, you know, really is our secret sauce, being able to kind of take over this college market. I'm assuming that your products are seasonal. Um, is that an issue with cash flow? No. So, you know, initially, I think part of the rebranding process was last year when we came on the show, we were just a gene company, right? So now rebranding into Jerpa, where it's a name, you know, there's a name around the brand. That was our next step. I think our next step for us now is to combat seasonality and become a year-round com company. But I think that really goes to our core values in terms of being able to provide that quality level that we want at an affordable price for our college students. So this summer, you know, we're looking into five-inch inseam shorts. I know like old trends start to come back. So some of the short shorts are coming back. So being able to provide that and those, you know, kind of shorts are $60, $70 at Lululemon, being able to provide those for $20, $30. And then one of our coolest projects is we're working on these bamboo cotton t-shirts. They're moisture wicking, uh, hypoallergenic. So being able to work on some of these high quality products and affordable price, that's how we want to combat seasonality and become a year round company. So you operate in this launch format, right? And so you carry a number of products for a period of time. And when they're gone, they're basically gone until you offer them again. So how are you creating the hype around these, these launch dates, if you will? I know there are a couple other companies that are out there. They're really pushing to the social media. They're saying that they have perhaps a drop, a product dropped at noontime. Um, are you using some type of social media platform to, to generate that type of interest as well? We're really hyping up our, our product via Instagram. That's our main platform that we do it. And, you know, what COVID allowed us to do was a, was a real planning process. Before, you know, we would get the product, launch the product, and then start to kind of push for the product. Versus now what we're doing is a one to two week push of content saying, okay, next week, next Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern is when the drop is there. We're hyping it up for about two weeks. And, you know, we're doing that through influencers, celebrities, that kind of thing. And being able to hype it up before the launch is keeping our consumers engaged, but also creating a sort of community base. And, you know, we kind of call it the Jerpa family, but being able to create a community base where now they know when the drops are and being able to be prepared for that to be able to successfully get some of the products that we're launching. Thank you, Austin, once again. Again, appreciate you coming in uh, and best of luck with Jerpa and everything in the future. For sure. Thank you guys so much for the opportunity again. Thank you. Our sixth team is Zora. My name is Royce Lan D'Souza. Um, I'm a Bachelor of Philosophy major. My name is Greg Castellas, and I'm a human-centered design and development major. Zora is a augmented reality platform that helps architects and engineers to be able to share 3D files in 3D. Architects have essentially already decided this is a need as they've been trying to achieve this, but through non-ideal means. So they've been converting these 3D designs into a 2D format and then sharing that and hoping it can convey what the experience of being in that building is going to be. We thought that was such an ironic concept that we wanted to actually be able to get people to experience the 3D files, get people to experience the buildings that they're going to be living in. It's a matter of being able to feel what it's like to be in that space rather than just have an idea of like, okay, this space has two windows. 
it's a matter of actually knowing what it feels like to have the space design as it is. And so that's what Zora is. Zora is a way that uses cloud rendering and just a URL to be able to share 3D files and get someone on the other end to view it. We want to really push how design and creation in this industry is done, but we want to turn it into a more fluid process. Hi, my name is Royce, the co-founder of Sora. Sora is transforming our designers and engineers view and share 3D files. Since the 80s, designers have been using powerful tools like AutoCAD to engineer the smallest of details. But when it comes to showcasing those designs, we're left to use slideshow screenshots and 2D renderings. It's ironic and frustrating you spend all this time engineering in 3D to have your vision showcased in 2D. It then begins the back and forth emails to iron out designs over text and the hassle of getting all stakeholders on the same page, a process that can take days, weeks, or even months. Design iteration is a vicious cycle. Zora eliminates these bottlenecks by allowing designers to upload their engineering files. Using cloud rendering and live link, we create a shareable 3D experience. Users navigate to the web link using a mobile phone's web browser and immediately step into the 3D space. Augmented reality allows anyone to get a sense of space, textures, and feel of the design. A foreman on the construction site can overlay the 3D design next to work completed. Zora eliminates the need for back and forth emails and centralizes design review around the model, not the emails, not the screenshot. We launched our beta test program in February. In total, we have generated over $2,000 of pre-launch revenue. Our beta program consists of two signed pilot agreements and 20 organizations demoing our product. Our customers have 150 plus employees and say that we're crucial to solving a problem for a trillion dollar construction architecture industry. We charge $50 a user a month for our beta program. Our main competitors like Visual Live and Unity require each user to buy a HoloLens or other expensive hardware. The capital investment is enough to deter a significant percentage of the market. Zora makes it easy not only to communicate, but to share ideas. We're a mix of Penn State students in the architecture, computer science, and philosophy programs. We're asking for $30,000, $22,000 to build a one-click solution within Autodesk streamlining the upload and sharing process even more. 8,000 will help us focus on one-on-one -on -one testing with our current beta testers and help us onboard more firms. The firms we talked to are excited to work with us. And for $30,000, we can make engineering visions truly come to life, not figuratively, but literally. So I hope you would come join us on this journey. If a picture is worth a thousand words, a 3D experience is worth a million. Thank you. Sure. Hi, Royce. Welcome. Welcome to you and the team and congratulations. It looks to me like you guys have developed uh, what I would consider a better better mousetrap. Uh, so that's pretty impressive and it's a good start. A lot of serious and larger, uh, both architects and designers have obviously, and you guys have pointed this out, spent a lot of money on various AutoCAD uh, systems. and. Although your price point is kind of interesting, and I think we're gonna have some questions about it, you, you're embarking on a pretty big challenge, which is to get people to uh, not just adopt your technology, but really to uh, pass on something that they've been using in many cases for many years, and pretty satisfactorily, by the way, I've used it. So let's talk about adoption because, uh, and, and we'll get to the money side of it later because I think that adoption is a big part of uh, whether or not this can really turn into a business. So adoption was one of our biggest challenges and still is to this day, because we're, we're facing this 10,000 pound gorilla, which is Autodesk, right? And they have this strong, they have this hold over the market. And so we had to either challenge them or add to them or work alongside the products that already exist. And so we've reached this point where People who are our customers are already using Autodesk products. And what they want is they just want that sharing aspect. They just want that aspect that Autodesk doesn't provide, which is I have 100 people that need to see this document. Each one needs to provide feedback. I don't have 10 weeks to do this feedback iteration process. I have two weeks, right? So how do I send it to all of them, right? And not all of them have, you know, $10,000 worth of software licenses just sitting around. 
right? But they still need to be able to see it. Um, and that's where we solve. And that's when we give that pitch to the VDC and VD, VDM managers, which are the design managers um, in a lot of design firms and construction firms that do, which are turning to design construction firms. They, they recept to that and they're like, how soon can I start? How soon can I try this? How soon can I beta test it? How soon can I get it onto the field? So I have a question. It's more of a clarification on your pricing structure. Um, is it $50 for three months? It gives you a license. Is that what I saw on the website? And can you just clarify yeah. that versus what was in your pitch materials? Yeah. So on our website right now for beta testers, we're charging fifty dollars um, for a three month license. But more recently, we've actually switched to a different model because we've talked to our customers and they actually wanted to switch to this model where we charge eighty dollars for hundred gigabytes, and we give this tool to all of their users. Um, and so we're actually switching into a more data approach because it's actually more feasible for this because they upload, they store, and they are not necessarily looking to delete things, right? Because this is their intellectual property, right? They want to they wanna keep that online. Um, and so we're switching to a more gigabyte model. And this would also help us you know, ease adoption without okay. having to pay per user. Well, Royce, thank you very much. Uh, again, congratulations. and. Uh, to you and the Zora team. Thanks, Royce. Awesome. And good luck. Thank you guys for having us. The teams have made their pitches. The judges have asked their questions. Now it's time for them to deliberate and decide which teams have done enough to earn the funds to make their idea a reality. The two women who are, uh, have started this are obviously really motivated. I think there is something there uh, really uh, worthy, and I was very excited. What they didn't answer was, uh, they talked about, frankly, what, what their difference was from what I think is the 800-pound gorilla in this conversation, which is an organization called Girls Who Code, um, which is a national organization that's pretty successful. So to me, the, the the ultimate question, so I liked it very much. I, I think that they're onto something. I think it's great. And I think Lou maybe mentioned, maybe they, they need a trademark search here to uh, decide whether or not they stick with that you know, title or whether they find something else. If it's a problem, uh, it's gonna hamper their opportunity, which I think is, is, is good. I have to tell you, I was really impressed with her presentation. I do think that she was well prepared and I certainly understand the space that she is trying to play in, recognizing it's going to be a heavy lift, but I think she did a great job defining um, the area, why she is focusing on predominantly white institutions for those students of color that are in that institution. Uh, I thought she did a really good job. I really did. I echo that, Sherry. I, I was very impressed with her confidence and her passion about what she's doing. Um, the only red flag from the discussion was that she is bottling these pro uh, products herself. Um, she and friends and family. And when you move to the next level and go to a factory, it is much more expensive. So her cost of goods is going to skyrocket. And I wonder what the price tolerance of those, um, what she's going to have to ask for the product, the retail price. Um, yeah. that, that's a concern. The infrastructure to me is going to be a big, big issue for them. You get in and around Gettysburg, yeah, there's a lot of technology. You get into Fulton County, Franklin County, it amazes me how many people live without cell phone coverage. <laughs> so part of my recommendation is to see if they could align themselves with some technology platforms that are geared towards farmers. I know Elon Musk is coming out with satellite-based technologies to be able to align almost like a cell phone industry where you're putting applications on your phones. If there's creating, if there's organizations, people like Musk creating technology for farmers, then that would be a logical place for them to, you know, distribute that app on those platforms. Um, but other than that, you know, that's an exciting area to help farmers, you know, find a way to squeeze out more profitability. 
which is a serious problem in this country. Again, it's, uh, it's an interesting market. Um, there are a lot of people that are very passionate about it, very loyal. Uh, it's, um, you know, if they can build a better mousetrap and get convince people to, to jump on board, I think there's an opportunity there. In my opinion, it's, it's one of those ones, it's just, it's, it's fun, it's cool, it's interesting, it's a passionate group of people that get into that, but uh, I, I just think they would struggle getting people to adopt it. Where does the information come from? Are they scraping other sites? Yeah, they're, they're collecting it. I mean, ESPN, CBS Sports, the NFL.com, NBA.com. So they're they're all, scraping. They're, they're all publishing that data and they're just trying to yeah. collect it, aggregate it. It's a good question because there are a lot of, as Bob is saying, you know, there are a lot of places you can aggregate data from, but as soon as you start selling that data, you're going to have to pay yeah. for it. <laughs> That's right. That's well, what I yeah. was thinking. Austin has great ideas. He is obviously very passionate about this brand. I liked his changes and his strategy moving forward. If he establishes a, a good brand presence and following, which he is very into building relationships with customers and he called them the Jerpa family, you know, I think he's he's got a shot at it. If he were in front of the real Shark Tanks, I think they would really be impressed with um, who he is. And that's a lot of the game is, is investing in the, in, in the entrepreneur themselves. Overall, I think it's an interesting idea. And the fact that they didn't win last year, but really did well during COVID times based on their spreadsheet is pretty impressive. As I said uh, in talking to the guys, I think that they, uh, they certainly created a better mousetrap. And, and so I admire that and I admire their, uh, uh, Royce and Greg, I admire their determination. Um, I think their challenge, like we've talked about with a few of these is, is really adaptability. Uh, are, are people really gonna adapt this? The real estate industry has already adopted this kind of technology, so people are becoming familiar with it, almost expect it. So from that standpoint, there's going to be a need for it on the, on, on the architectural design side, because that's what people are going to expect. I just went through this process and, you know, they showed us, you know, a glimpse of a, a new home through a platform similar to this, and now it's all gone. Like, I don't never get to see it again. <laughs> so, and again, I think they're, they, they are definitely building a better mousetrap. This question is where, do, where does that mousetrap get applied to? The judges have deliberated. The decisions are made. Now, the teams will find out who will receive money to fund their company. Thank you, everyone. Y'all did a great job presenting your companies and answering the questions. Hopefully they weren't too difficult for you. As some of us who have been on uh, involved in the event Penn State and, and the, the growth of the entrepreneurship community here at Penn State, every year it just seems like the companies get better and more sophisticated. So this year's no exception. Y'all did a fantastic job. However, we are now at the point where we will award the teams who we felt best demonstrated their company is ready to take the next step in their entrepreneurial journey. Uh, unlike other years, we've decided this year to award three equal amounts uh, to three deserving companies. The first award of $10,000 goes to Girls Code the, Code the World. So congratulations. 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 Thank you so much. The second award of $10,000 goes to Miss Monroe. Congratulations. Congratulations, Jalen. <laughs> and the final $10,000 award goes to Table Rock Markets. So congratulations, Aiden and Jake. Doing it. And again, congratulations to all of you. You all did a fantastic job. Like I said, this was a hard year, but um, you all have a bright future. Keep working on your businesses and look forward to seeing you 
you as successful entrepreneurs in, the, in your Penn State journey. So congratulations. The competition was heated. The judges were tough, but three of our teams managed to win them over. Congratulations to the winning teams. They leave with the money to jumpstart their emerging companies. For the other teams, it's time to reposition for the next pitch. Thank you for joining us for The Investment. Prize money for The Investment was made possible by Penn State College of Engineering. Invent Penn State. Ben Franklin Technology Partnership. Robert and Tammy Morgan Foundation. Penn State Schreier Honors College. The investment is made possible by KCF Technologies in State College, founded on a vision to transform American industry. The official industrial innovation partner of Penn State Athletics. Online at kcftech.com. Everett Cash Mutual Insurance Company, providing farm and commercial insurance coverage for Pennsylvania's farming and agribusiness industries since 1913. Information at www.everettcash.com. Ben Franklin Technology Partners, Ulysses Financial Communications and Strategy, and viewers like you. Thank you.